So I think we're live now. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's webinar on asthma and allergy awareness. Um, my name is James Rehill. I'm a nurse working here in the healthcare team in Fleming Medical. And my role, I guess, is to help people get the best achievable outcomes from all of our products. And the best way we find to do that is to provide you with experts in their field, such as Dr. Dorothy Ryan here this morning, um, to provide you with the evidence base um, around all of our products and, and um, diseases such as asthma. Um, I'm delighted to be hosting this morning's webinar um, with our expert, Dr. Dorothy Ryan, a consultant respiratory physician in Beaumont Hospital. Uh, we have over 400 people registered for this morning's event, so you're not alone, obviously, in wanting to know a lot more about asthma. Um, this is part of our monthly webinar series. I'm following on from the success of last month's webinar. Last month's webinar was run by Professor Georgina Getham of the School of Nursing and Midwifery in NUIG in Galway on advanced, advanced wound care. Um, but this morning, we're been host it's being hosted by Dr. Dorothy Ryan. Um, a special shout out to all of our colleagues and customers in the Middle East for joining us this morning. And thank you all to everybody in Ireland and the UK who took the time out to register for this morning's event. Um, as we've said already, the, the agenda of this morning will be primarily dealt with by Dr. Ryan. Um, so I'll hand you over now to Dr. Ryan um, and we we'll have loads of time for questions. And everything at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, James. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to Fleming for inviting me to speak. And essentially what I'm going to be discussing today is asthma and allergy awareness and the central role of inhaled steroids in asthma. There's two sections to my talk. So in the first section, I'll be discussing our response to allergens and their importance in asthma. And the second part of the talk is in suppressing asthmatic inflammation and how we can use exhaled nitric oxide or pheno in assessing that response. And essentially that inhaled corticosteroids have a central role in both of these areas. So we know that asthma is characterized by variable airflow obstruction. And essentially, if we're to diagnose asthma, we need to confirm that usually with spirometry, or we can do that with a peak flow diary uh, that the patients can complete for us. And asthma is characterized by this tendency to have periods of perhaps very good health, but then also uh, very symptomatic times. And probably the majority of asthma patients would describe that they have triggers for their asthma. And these triggers classically worsen symptoms. And the triggers we probably be familiar with can be mostly inhaled triggers. So things that they breathe into their lungs. So allergens would be in that category. So house dust mite, mold, grass and, and tree pollens, but also inhaled irritants. So perhaps chemical sprays, pollution, inhaled cigarette smoke, and cold air the patients breathe in can exacerbate. And then there's other factors such as exercise, which may trigger their symptoms. However, most of those triggers won't actually cause what we call an acute exacerbation of asthma. Um, and to do that, we use the term an inducer, but allergens are an inducer and can cause acute exacerbation of asthma, which really obviously is quite a serious thing. And that's why they're so important um, when we're talking about asthma and the relevance of allergens. And the other major inducer is viral respiratory infections. And I think we've really found during the COVID pandemic um, that that has really highlighted the importance of viral infections in terms of triggering asthma. At Beaumont, we've seen a 40% reduction in asthma admissions to the hospital throughout the pandemic. And that's hugely due to the fact that patients are keeping their distance, wearing their masks, using their alcohol hand gel. And so all the common viral uh, precipitants of asthma exacerbations essentially have gone away during that time with very little flu. Um, and, and it's a really nice learning point, I suppose, for patients going forward. But really today's talk is going to mainly focus, as I say, on these allergens. 
So in terms of the importance of allergens, so the concept of um, allergens being relevant is really a, a term we call atopy. And so atopy is the tendency for an individual person to develop antibodies to specific immunoglobulin E's. So atopy is very common. It has a prevalence about one in three in the population. One in six will have symptoms such as hay fever. And about one in 12 of the population will have atopic asthma. So that's a really common uh, condition to have. And the four important allergen groups are pollen, such as tree and grass pollen, fungal spores, the commonest of which is aspergillus, animal dander, so our cats, dogs, horses, rabbits, and then household mites or insects. So for most of us, that would be house dust mite. But in certain areas of the world, for example, in America, cockroach would be another insect that would be very relevant and that patients can be allergic to. There's also seasonal influences. So be very aware of the seasonality to pollen. So spring in particular is a high uh, prevalence of tree pollen. Grass is a peak during the summer. And then in the autumn, as you've got decaying vegetation, you get release of predominantly aspergillus fungal spores into the atmosphere. And also at that time, you get a peak of house dust mite. And part of that is to do with house dust mite loving to feed on fungal spores. Climate is also very important. Humidity increases um, house dust mites. They like to thrive in a humid environment. And they, by contrast, can't survive in a cold environment. So classically at high altitude, you have very little house dust mite. And that can influence uh, the prevalence of asthma in people who live at high altitude. So not everybody is susceptible to inhaled allergens and asthma is a very genetically um, dominant condition. And so you have a genetically predisposed individual who gets exposed to an allergen at some point in their lives. That might be quite early in life or could be later. And then with ongoing chronic exposure, that individual may develop asthma. And we know that with increased exposure, that you're more likely to develop asthma. And so there's been studies showing where they've measured the, the amount of house dust mite in a household, and they found that house dust mite sensitized children had doubled the risk of asthma for every doubling of the quantity of house dust mite in their environment. Now this slide um, has a picture that's quite an old picture from a, a textbook that I, I love to use as maybe 30 years old at this stage um, but this is a nice picture of what happens when um, one of um, our asthma patients is exposed to an allergen to which they're sensitized and this one showed ragweed so it's um, kind of more American um, term as such. So we all would be familiar likely with patients describing where if they walk into a house where there's cats and they're allergic to cats that quite quickly they can develop asthmatic symptoms. And that is classic of what we call the early response to an allergen. And you can see it quite nicely here. I'll use my pointer where this is your uh, forced expiratory volume in the first second. So before exposure, the patient has a really good, decent um, FV1. They get exposed to ragweed and there's a dramatic drop in their FV1. And that happens quite quickly over about 10 or 20 minutes, but it recovers. Um, and then it pretty much looks good over the, over the following time. If the patient takes a blue inhaler, either when they have onset of their symptoms or before they're exposed to an allergen, the short acting beta agonist can pretty much treat that early response very effectively. Long acting beta agonist similarly can um, inhibit that early response. The lower part of the graph here is what we call the late response, and this would be consistent with an asthma exacerbation. And so over the hours following uh, exposure to the allergen, uh, the patient's lung function has dropped. And what you see here is a sensitivity um, in the airways. They're very hyper responsive. So this is a histamine challenge. So histamine um, PC20 means the dose of histamine that will cause a 20% drop in lung function. So prior to exposure, you can see here that they needed almost 10 milligrams per mil, a high concentration of histamine to bring about a 20% drop. But then as they've been exposed to their allergen, they only needed a tiny amount to get a 20% drop in lung function. And that's quite a drop in lung function would definitely give you symptoms. And so over the period of a few days, they're highly sensitive uh, to histamine, but also to other triggers of their asthma, smoke, cold air, exercise. So they become highly, uh, what we call hyper responsive. 
And we know that uh, short acting beta agonists won't help with that, but a long acting beta agonist will inhibit that late response. And if, quite impressively, even just a single dose of an inhaled steroid will inhibit that late response. Not too surprisingly, inhaled steroid won't prevent the early response because inhaled steroid doesn't work that rapidly. Um, but it is interesting that only a single dose can reduce that late response that has onset over hours to days afterwards. What's also important to know um, is that if a patient is using a blue inhaler excessively, and a lot of asthma patients who are uncontrolled tend to overuse their blue inhaler, that causes the complete opposite. So rather than that blue inhaler helping with their um, bronchial responsiveness to their allergen, it has the exact opposite. So they actually have a worsening of their early and their late response when they're using Saba or um, Salbutamol um, excessively. And this is thought to be one of the reasons why um, we see an increase in asthma deaths in patients who are on sole uh, Saba therapy. And this data, as I say, I mean, this is well recognized for decades. And interestingly, it's only um, now that we're in our GINA guidelines recommending that we never have patients on just SABA therapy. And we also should never have them on just LABA therapy. That if we've got our mild asthmatic, they should be on as required combined inhaled steroid uh, with a long acting beta agonist. If we know that our patient is allergic and we can test this both in blood and by skin prick testing, and um, we, we know then it's logical that we should try and avoid allergens to uh, treat our asthma. Now, that wouldn't be the only thing we do, but it would be a very important thing to do. Uh, so going through house dust mite. So patients often aren't aware that they're house dust mite sensitive. And the reason for that is that house dust mites aren't in huge amounts in the air. So they're embedded into soft furnishings and classically uh, thrive in our mattress, uh, pillow and duvet covers. So patients essentially are chronically exposed to house dust mite. So it's this background constant level of exposure um, for you know, the, all of their, half their day, eight, eight to 10 hours, a lot of people might sleep at night and they're constantly exposed to house dust mite over that time. So they're not aware of, um, I suppose, acute worsenings related to house dust mite because it's a constant exposure. Um, the only way you can stimulate them to get into the air is with vigorous cleaning. And that's another reason why uh, asthmatic patients that they get a um, uh, get out of uh, jail free card where they shouldn't be doing the vacuuming, for example, they shouldn't be doing that vigorous cleaning of um, soft furnishings. So to control house dust mite, the um, covers that we use to protect our mattresses really to put a barrier between the patient and the house dust mite. So there's literally a physical barrier to, um, that can't be penetrated by the house dust mite. But they do still need to be cleaned because house dust mite, even from your carpets, can actually pretty much jump up onto your um, covers, which is a bit kind of not nice to think about, but, uh, but that's the case. Um, in your bedroom, ideally that you don't have curtains or carpets so that you might have blinds and water line of flooring. But if you do have curtains that they're washable, that you put them on a hot wash intermittently. And also um, if you have carpets, steam cleaning is another way of uh, controlling house dust mite. Um, regular vacuuming with a vacuum cleaner that has a HEPA filter is also effective and to minimize your upholstered furniture and to, to consider leather, for example. For children in particular, it's important not to have their, their bed full of soft toys um, because they are a breeding ground for house dust mite, aside from uh, um, relevant things and young babies not having toys in the cot. And you can hot wash them or you can freeze them to control the house dust mite burden. There's no evidence for air filtration units or ionizers, and you can see in terms of that they're not airborne, so air filtration units will not be effective for house dust mite. In contrast, pet dander and pet allergens are very airborne. And impressively, 60% of asthma patients are pet allergic when you test for it. And about a third of sensitized patients are living with a pet, which is a real challenge. And in my experience, if patients know they're allergic and have a pet, they generally have made that choice. And it's very difficult to 
um, get them to give up that pet. You can have conversations around not getting further pets when the animal dies, but um, a lot of animals obviously could be with us for up to 20 years. So that's not really a, a great option. So we do need to counsel our patients on pet dander control. Very importantly, the pet should not be in the main living area that where the, uh, the person will be um, a lot of the time and absolutely shouldn't be even allowed uh, upstairs or near bedrooms. HEPA filter air cleaners are helpful in terms of pet dander because it's, there's a lot of it in the air. Um, so every time your cat or dog shakes himself or otherwise there's a huge amount that goes into the air. If your pet is washable, um, you should wash them um, within reason as often as possible. And again, that shouldn't be the person with asthma who's washing the pet. Any furniture that they're near should be thoroughly cleaned, so steam cleaning can be used. But ideally that, for example, you'd have leather couches rather than uh, soft couches, or if you've, if you've upholstered couches, that the animal is not allowed in that room. And as with house dust mites, you're trying to minimise carpet and bedding and um, upholstery for all those same reasons. Interestingly, when I worked in New York, I had a patient who used to wash her cat. And um, now I had a cat years ago and it didn't like even a splash of water. So I don't know how she managed to wash her cat. But there is no evidence to say that washing your cat will will help in terms of reducing allergens. Um, and it's also unclear whether there's any difference between male or female cats or whether male cats are castrated or not. There's some thoughts that those things may be helpful. And we've no idea if different breeds of cat or dog have um, differ in terms of allergen concentrations. So you'll hear a lot of patients saying, oh, well, I have a hypoallergenic dog, I have a dog that doesn't shed. But the reality is all dogs will shed to some degree. Um, and the good thing, I suppose, about the non-shed dogs is they tend to have um, veal hair as such rather than fur, and so they are uh, washable. So they can be uh, they can be better, but they're still not um, perfectly safe. The next part then of my talk I'm going to concentrate now on is on exhaled nitric oxide and how it can help us when we're managing our patients with asthma. And really the main use it has is in titrating um, our inhaled corticosteroid and identifying patients that should respond to inhaled corticosteroids. I'll take you through what it is exactly, when it's useful, some pitfalls potentially, and then I'll finish up with three cases from my own severe asthma service. Nitric oxide is a gas. We all exhale it in our breath. So in, I suppose, a healthy human without asthma, we'd have a low amount of exhaled nitric oxide in breath. It's also a pollutant found in exhaust fumes and cigarette smoke. And we know that patients with eosinophilic asthma, so asthma that's driven by eosinophil inflammation, we also call that TH2 high asthma due to the cytokines that drive the production of eosinophils, that in those patients, they have very high levels of nitric oxide in their exhaled breath. And in fact, the enzyme that drives that production is a different enzyme to that that drives the production in healthy humans. So, the mechanism is, I suppose, an abnormal physiology. Um, and atopic or allergic asthma is a type of eosinophilic asthma, a TH2 high asthma. So, you know, really links in uh, very well with what we've just been discussing. The device where we use, um, where we measure exhaled nitric oxide has hugely changed over time and we now have this very nice portable device and the recognition of its best use has also only in recent um, decade or so been recognised um, and that usefulness in terms of titrating um, our inhaled steroid dose. So as you can see here from the image, it's a small portable device. Uh, so we have one of these in our asthma clinic. It's very accurate. You just need to do one test per patient. It has a disposable filter and you get a number and that number is parts per billion of nitric oxide in the exhaled breath. It's highly accurate below a level of 30 with minimal variability of about less than three parts per billion and there's a little bit more variability in the higher numbers 
but it's still a very accurate test and it doesn't tend to be clinically uh, relevant to that variability. It's also possible to measure this test in children from the age of four and up. Um, I have to say I've never had to perform the test in children. Sometimes it's challenging in adults, so I think it could be tricky for some children, but um, they're so computer savvy, maybe not. When is exhaled nitric oxide useful? So it's really useful to identify patients who have that TH2 high inflammation. It's useful in terms of treating them with an inhaled corticosteroid and monitoring that dose and assessing their response to that treatment. And I've here a few bullet points of uses of exhaled nitric oxide. On top of the list, I've put what I would call the most controversial, and that is whether pheno in and of itself can be used for diagnosis of asthma. So you'll remember at the start of my talk when I mentioned about diagnosing asthma, I mentioned about spirometry and peak flow. It's a physiological diagnosis. It's not an inflammatory diagnosis. So pheno is a marker but it's a, a it's a piece of the puzzle rather than it can fully diagnose it what's i suppose a little bit controversial now is that the nice guidelines in the uk have put pheno um, as a very central role in the diagnosis of asthma and a lot of respiratory consultants uh, would not agree with that including in the uk phenotyping means your type of asthma so are you an allergic type of asthma are you eosinophilic type of asthma um, are you a, 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 an asthmatic who has low levels of those? So pheno will, will identify that you are that TH2 high type of asthma, which is by far the commonest type of asthma. Um, they say at least two thirds is probably far higher than that. And as I've mentioned, we can use it then to dose our inhaled corticosteroids. So essentially, inhaled steroids suppress the levels. So we know if the levels are high, we put a patient on inhaled steroid the level should fall. Um, if the level is low and the patient is on an inhaled steroid, we can look to down titrate the dose and monitor the pheno to see if it remains suppressed. It also can therefore be a measure of adherence. So if your patient initially takes their inhaler, their pheno suppresses, and then over a period of time, if their exhaled nitric oxide rises again, that could be because they've stopped taking their inhaler regularly which can be a very common challenge for patients in terms of taking any medications regularly. And we know when we look at adherence to not just inhalers, but blood pressure tablets and other medications, adherence is only in around 50 to 60% on average. Exhaled nitric also rises during exacerbations. And if your exhaled nitric oxide is high, it actually predicts an increased risk for asthma exacerbation. So lowering it will make your patient safer and um, it will improve their control, reduce their exacerbation risk and may even reduce their risk of an asthma death. And then my final point here is that it can predict response to some of our monoclonal antibodies which are specialised treatments that we have for severe asthmatics. And going along with my initial statement around it being insufficient for diagnosis alone, there are other conditions that can cause an increased exhaled nitric oxide. It's not specific just to asthma, but it is the main condition for which it's approved. It's used as approved really just for asthma. I've mentioned about uh, using exhaled nitric oxide as a measure of adherence, and this is a slide from Professor Richard Costello, one of my colleagues in Beaumont, and he was involved in the Inca Sun clinical trial. And there were a lot of really nice benefits out of this trial. The main, I suppose, concept of the trial was that patients took a, an inhaler that had a, an electronic device attached to it, and this measured when the patient took their inhaler and whether they took it correctly. So on the bottom panel of the slide here, you can see each blue line that corresponds to a dose of their um, inhaler. And this one here, so this is two doses in a day. So you can see the patient is taking two doses most days, which, which the patient should. This day, they only took one dose. This day, for some reason, they took four doses. Here you can see a gap where they didn't take any doses at all for about a week and again here maybe for a two-week gap. The patients also 
measured their peak flow electronically and they had their exhaled nitric oxide measured intermittently at their clinic visits. So you can see this patient started off with a high exhaled nitric oxide, which suppressed quite quickly and nicely with inhaled steroid. And you can see really good adherence there. Uh, here his peak flow was in the red zone. And within a few weeks of using <clears throat> regular inhaled steroid, <clears throat> you can see that improvement in peak flow nicely um, with a, a good maintenance over time. And so that's a nice visualization of the fact that your exhaled nitric oxide will suppress quickly with an inhaled steroid but the benefit in terms of improvement in lung function symptom control and an overall um, feeling better in terms of your asthma it does take a few weeks so you need a few weeks of inhaled steroid to get those benefits but it quite rapidly reduces your exhaled nitric oxide The other markers we have for TH2 high asthma are not, I suppose, as easy in some ways to measure, um, but there's pros and cons to each of these measures. So exhaled nitric oxide, some patients cannot manage the technique. And also you need the equipment and the equipment is, is um, uh, you know, has, has a cost to it and then the consumables as well. Um, but the, in terms of the training for the equipment, that's not, uh, that's not a major factor. Sputum eosinophils are really useful because they're a direct measure of asthmatic airway inflammation, but essentially you need um, specialized trained staff to do that. It's very time consuming, uh, both in terms of getting a sample from the patient, you may need to induce sputum. Uh, and then also actually the processing of the sputum itself uh, can take up to two hours. So that's really not available to most of us and is predominantly used in the research setting. And then the marker that most of us would easily be able to use are blood eosinophils. And so that's a simple blood test. So for most patients, that wouldn't be an issue unless they're needle phobic. But of course, it only partially correlates with airway inflammation. So it's not a direct measure of airway inflammation, which is the downside of it. We also need to factor in that there's some variables which can both increase or suppress exhaled nitric oxide. So we have a huge amount of exhaled nitric oxide naturally in our nose. And if we have allergic rhinitis, that increases even more so. There can be the possibility of some contamination from the nose in the exhaled breath. Now, the device is designed in such a manner to minimize that. But if you have a patient with very symptomatic uh, severe rhinitis, it may push up your exhaled nitric oxide on your breath test. If the patient's actively smoking, it will suppress their pheno and so can make it trickier to identify that they have TH2 inflammation. And we probably aren't as good at diagnosing asthma in smokers for a variety of reasons. And then we don't perform the test after any kind of what I call heavy breathing or forced expiratory maneuvers. So we wouldn't do it after exercise. And also similarly, you don't do it immediately after spirometry. That forced uh, maneuver can increase up the exhaled nitric oxide a little bit. And then of course, what value um, are we concerned about? Very much, I would say, exhaled nitric oxide is a trend analysis. So you're looking at multiple values over time rather than being fixated on one single value. And similarly, kind of consistent with that, um, there is some difference um, both in America and say um, British guidelines in terms of what those cutoffs should be. So the American Thoracic Society would say that if your exhaled nitric oxide is less than 25 and you're not on an inhaled steroid, you're less likely to respond to inhaled steroid. And if the number is above 50, you're very likely to respond to an inhaled steroid and is consistent with this TH2 inflammation. In the BTS and NICE guidelines, they use a cutoff of 40. And finally, I'm going to take you through three cases from my severe asthma service that hopefully will give you a flavor for the patients themselves and where exhaled nitric oxide I've found to be useful. The first patient here is Mr. X, who's a 62 year old gentleman. And a picture paints a thousand words, I suppose. You have a look here at his spirometry and we can see the flow volume loop and this really obstructed pattern. And if I didn't have his details, my first suspicion would be that this is the spirometry of a patient with COPD and um, with that really scooped out looking flow volume loop. 
Now it's hard to appreciate because this is small and the difference on the graph is small, but he does have a bronchodilator response of 14%, which would be consistent with a significant bronchodilator response, suggestive of an asthma component. And of course, he's a lifelong never smoker making it uh, highly unlikely that this is the spirometry of a COPD patient. But we do see this in a patient who's older and has had asthma for a long time, that they can essentially develop almost fixed airflow obstruction and severe obstruction. He was um, steroids, despite um, uh, this low lung function, he was um, dependent on steroids and had evidence of a blood eosinophilia at times, which would rise during his exacerbations, which is classic of asthma. And every time he um, had his steroid weans, so he'd have steroids for an exacerbation, every time he came down in the dose, he would have a, a, a further relapse in symptoms and we were bouncing up and down on his steroids. And essentially, we decided to keep him on a maintenance of 15 milligrams, which seemed to keep him at his most stable and his lung function was improved on that dose. But unfortunately, he was getting into trouble with side effects from his steroid with osteopenia on his DEXA scan. And in the context of all of that steroid requirement, we put him on the waiting list for anti-IL-5 therapy. You can see here, um, this was the previous flow volume loop. This is the one when he was on 15 milligrams of steroid. And the writing's too small to see. So you can see that FEV1 went from 41% to 65% on his 15 milligrams of steroid. And that really can... Um, mean a lot to patients that extra uh, amount of lung volume or lung um, uh, function. But down the bottom here, you have nearly missed a, a small um, measurement here of his pheno, which was at 54. And so if we think back of our American and our British guidelines, both would agree that that's a high exhaled nitric oxide. And this is actually in a patient who's on inhaled steroid. Um, so it's a high level despite being on steroid. And so while he was awaiting his inhaled, um, sorry, while he was awaiting his monoclonal antibody therapy, we decided to see could we get that um, pheno better. And so this is his pheno over a six month period. And you can see here actually when we first measured it, it was even higher still, it was at 72. He was on an inhaled steroid with a LABA and we added in a second inhaled steroid. And when we did that, we saw a nice reduction down to 39, which was a 45% reduction. And we were reasonably happy with that. Over the following months, it bounced around a little bit, but pretty much was similar over those few months. However, at this stage here, the patient was getting into trouble with side effects from all of that inhaled steroids, so notably pharyngitis, which would be a common problem with them. And what we did was we changed over his second inhaled steroid to what's called a small particle inhaled corticosteroid. And the one I used was seclesonide. Um, so that um, generates a very small particle which goes deeper into the lungs, but also has no absorption in the mouth. So there's no side effect of pharyngitis. And that actually worked really nicely for this gentleman where we had a, a reduction in his pheno down to 22, um, a further 51% reduction. The second case is a young lady who's 23 with a diagnosis of asthma since the age of two. And she had been a frequent exacerbator with multiple courses of steroids, a &E admissions and hospitalizations. And despite all of that, she always had quite good lung function. However, if that persists over time, of course, she could end up like our last patient with reduced and um, fixed airflow obstruction. She was atopic with multiple positive specific IgEs to house dust mite, cat, dog, grass and pollen. And this patient was put onto Amelizumab, which is an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody, to see could we get her asthma better controlled. And this would be a step five therapy, so she would have been on maximal uh, inhaled corticosteroid and all other um, step therapies tried up until that. So she initially did really well, um, and for many years did really well, but she was on a dose that required to have this injection every two weeks. She had to come into the hospital it was given subcutaneously and she had to be monitored for half an hour afterwards. So it was, it was quite an impact on her life. And as time went by, she started to have a relapse in her attendance for her anti-IgE therapy. And with that, her asthma control worsened and she started having A&E visits and ultimately a hospitalization. 
at that stage, we repeated her lung function, which again was still really good. But when we did her nitric oxide, um, I'm sorry, and I forgot to say she's dogs. <laughs> um, despite um, being dog allergic, she does have two dogs. So she says that uh, they're outside. Uh, she also has a high BMI, which also would be a, a challenge in terms of asthma. We know that's not good for our asthma. And as I said, when we did our exhaled nitric oxide, it was markedly elevated, so 168, which really is about as high as it goes. Uh, so that would suggest not only perhaps was she not attending for her IgE therapy, but she potentially wasn't taking her inhaled steroid. And so really it was refocusing back on the basics with this young lady to say, you really need to take your inhaled steroid. And omelizumab may not have a major impact on exhaled nitric oxide, probably a little bit, but the most potent reducer of exhaled nitric oxide is in her inhaled steroid. So going back to the basics, getting um, back onto her inhaled steroid, um, minimizing her environmental allergen exposures, and of course having discussions around her weight, which is a, a real challenge. And then the last case I'll take you through is Mrs. Z, who is 46, and she has severe eosinophilic asthma. So she had a period of over two years of really poor control with 12 hospitalizations to Beaumont Hospital. And interestingly, she hadn't managed to see or be referred to a respiratory specialist during that time. She had multiple uh, psychosocial pressures. She was a single parent with four children. She suffered from anxiety and depression, and she'd had an admission to a psychiatry unit following an overdose. And so when we met her on, I think, her 12th hospital admission, uh, she had all of these factors present. Because of them, she'd also had to give up her job as a carer. So she had financial pressures, social pressures, and psychological pressures, all, I suppose, contributing potentially to um, a difficulty in controlling her asthma on top of everything. She was also morbidly obese with a BMI of 42.9. Uh, we did a DEXA scan given all her steroid exposures and thankfully that was normal. And then over here, you can see her flow volume loop. It is small, I apologize for that, but you might be able to make out the two volume loops here with a difference before and after bronchodilator. And that showed a baseline FV1 at 65% and a 19% uh, bronchodilator response. And that was despite being on 10 milligrams of steroids at the time and high dose inhaled corticosteroid with a LABA. However, again, when we measured her exhaled nitric oxide, and I know it's small, but it's 101 parts per billion. And to my mind, I think with it was such a challenging social situation, I would wonder is, is the patient able to take her inhaled steroid as, as much as she needs to. Um, many patients will more quickly take a, an acute burst of steroids or even a maintenance steroid tablet uh, than they will their inhaler. A lot of people can tend to forget their inhaler. So again, with this lady, it was refocusing on um, getting her on uh, perhaps a different inhaler and re-engaging her in taking it. And maybe a once a day inhaler might suit her better than the twice a day. In summary, inhaled corticosteroids are highly effective and important in eosinophilic asthma, and we have exhaled nitric oxide now as a useful guide to dosing, so that hopefully we have patients on enough, but on, not on too much. Allergens, we know, can precipitate acute asthma exacerbations. Increased exposure is associated with increased risk for asthma in genetically predisposed patients, and we should really make um, all measures to avoid and reduce allergen exposure. And I'd be happy to take any questions if you want to use the Q&A tab. Yeah, for mine. I think the idea of just might hopping up onto my curtains is quite frightening. <laughs> All right. It is a bit creepy, I have to agree. <laughs> um, perfect. Um, I'm just going to take you through a few short slides here on some of our products um, that may be related to asthma um, that primarily you'd see in the community. There's one or two products, um, well, I'll show you as we go on, that could potentially be used in both the community and an in-hospital setting. Um, this is a nice image. It shows if you walk into any of your local pharmacies, what, what products you might pick out that might, may be related to asthma and home health. Um, or key job in the community, um, no matter what our role is, be it a pharmacist or technician or whatever, even if we work in the community, 
is to keep patients with asthma as well as they can be um, for as long as that can be maintained. So products such as peak flow meters are really good. I'll talk to you about peak flow meters in a minute. Um, but the first product I'll show you here is a spirometry unit. You notice there, um, Dr. Ryan, a lot of our studies um, showed any of our steroids were based around uh, FEV1 and, and the, the lung volume, basically. They're achieved by using a spirometry test or pulmonary function test. This is our device. Um, it's quite a unique product. So this product requires zero calibration. Um, an awful lot of time when people are using spirometry or pulmonary function tests, there can be a lot of work in calibrating them with gases and so on and so forth. This uses an ultrasonic based um, model to measure the, the basically the amount of air that goes out of our lungs, the, the speed or the volume of which that goes out and how much comes back into our lungs. Um, and it's a good indicator of overall lung health. This would be an ideal product, be it in hospital. Um, so any of your GP surgeries would be ideal. Um, and it's a really nice, this is actually the size of it here. I have it in my hand. Um, so really small, compact device. It uses disposable Spiro Scout tubes. And you mightn't be able to see it there, but you can see it's just a wide bore in that device there. The patient forcefully expires air through that, but there's zero resistance in that, which is good. So it, it requires less effort on our patient then to get a good overall understanding of their lung health. And um, if anybody is interested in, in a Spiro Scout, be it in a local pharmacy or GP or wherever, do get in contact with us. We'd be more than happy for you to trial the device. And um, then the peak flow meters, peak flow meters are the old reliable. They do exactly what they say on the tin. And um, you notice here from this graph, there's a green, yellow and red indicator. So green for go or green for good in this instance. Um, and when we refer to the colors, with our peak flow meter, they come with three small tabs that you can move yourself. So or you move them back to zero, you take a deep breath and forcefully expire air for generally it's about over six seconds, I believe, or for as long as you can. And repeat that three times. Um, and it's just important to keep a really close eye on that um, and keep a diary of your peak flow readings. Um, nebulizers then are another gold standard product in the community and in hospital by times. Um, and the most common nebulizer you'd see out there would be a compressor nebulizer. Compressor nebulizers are really great devices. Um, they use compressed air to break the liquid basically up into a mist. So you can then inhale it um, and get the benefit of that, be it a steroid or whatever medication has been inhaled in that. Um, and compressor nebulizers are great, but we also have to remember that a lot of patients are quite restricted by times with any illness and asthma is no different, I guess. Um, and if you were asking some asthma, you would see there Dr. Ryan's cases had people from their 20s right through to their 60s or 70s. Um, and we want to promote independence, but we also want to promote that medication compliance. And I was quite shocking to hear that medication adherence been down as low as 50% in certain cases. So if we can provide people um, with, if somebody's heavily reliant on nebulizers, um, suggest a portable nebulizer. Um, a portable nebulizer, not alone is it just, just a portable device, but it allows these patients to live their life more freely. Do you know, if they were heading away for a weekend in your early 20s, the last thing you want to be packing and you, you may neglect it is a compressor nebulizer. But if you were to take something like our portable nebulizer here and pop the mask off it, it's very easy to transport. It can be brought in a handbag or a toilet bag or whatever you need to bring it in. Um, and yet again, it's promoting medic medication compliance and independence for our patients. Another thing that's really useful um, for medication adherence um, would be our Medicare LifeSense app. Our LifeSense app is, it's not specific to asthma, it's specific to overall health and good health and maintenance of that. 
is all of our devices here in the Medicare range, well, a lot of them are Bluetooth enabled, such as our pulse oximeter or, or blood pressure monitors, so on and so forth. Um, and that's one way that we can keep track of all of these measurements. But in relation to asthma and medication compliance, you can set reminders on this device to say that you're due medication at eight o'clock in the morning and again at say two o'clock in the afternoon, you set reminders, it prompts then our patients, we, we can assume by times that people will just remember to take these medications, but life is, is busy by times, you know, and sometimes we do need to be reminded. So if you're in a community, be it in a pharmacy role or whatever, or even if you are in hospital and you're getting ready to discharge your patients or they're going out into the community, um, if you could, even spend five minutes with your patient to try and just address medication compliance with them. We want to keep them as well as they can be for as long as that's achievable. Um, and try to get them to even get the Medicare LifeSense app downloaded and set the reminders um, for them to take their medication. Um, there's some other products then I guess we've spoke about a lot of them. So from our portable nebulizer to compressor nebulizer, information leaflets, we have them. If you work in a pharmacy, please get in touch with us. If you don't have any of our asthma awareness and patient diaries, um, let us know and we'll, we'll drop them out to you. Um, and that's pretty much it from me. So what I'll do now is we'll just run through some questions here and I'd be more than happy to um, ask Dr. Ryan to give her opinion on them. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see the questions at the minute. Dr. I can Ryan. indeed there, yeah. Um, so I'd be happy to, um, to go through them. So I see one of uh, the questions is a very good one. How would as asthmatics avoid the increasing pollen count in the summer months and are antihistamines enough? So this is the real challenge with allergens that a huge majority of allergens really, they're not avoidable. So house dust mite, we can try and control it, but ultimately we can't eradicate house dust mite, we can't avoid it completely. And similarly, it's very difficult to place ourselves in a bubble um, during spring and summer and autumn for the allergens that are in the environment. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting with the social distancing and wearing masks that it has helped asthmatics, but really it's not terribly socially acceptable. So in terms of avoiding pollen, you know, I'd have had some patients who had a fear of going outside, really almost um, agoraphobic related to uh, pollen, um, which, you know, really is not, um, is not uh, great for their mental health. So essentially, it is trying to um, to prescribe an antihistamine ahead of uh, coming into the season that they're particularly allergic. So I would often recommend perhaps even as long as a month ahead of the season that they would start a regular antihistamine and to continue it throughout the season. And that can um, can offset some of the, the symptoms. Um, and again, not to be the person perhaps cutting the grass if you're grass allergic, those sort of common sense things. Another question we have there, is it possible that strong smells affect asthma? So that's a really good question. So definitely inhaled irritants can affect some asthmatics, but food smells, I suppose, as such, wouldn't really be in that category of inhaled irritants. So when we're talking about inhaled irritants, we're talking about predominantly sprays that are chemicals that have molecules of a size that we breathe in. Uh, so perfumes, sprays, and um, cleaning agents. Strong smells, if you had a very spicy food, definitely for any of us, that can actually trigger cough. So the classic um, cough trigger used in research studies is capsaicin, um, which is a, a type of a, a spice, I believe. So if you had very spicy food, it can definitely um, trigger cough in anybody. Um, but in particular, where strong smells are important are in asthmatics who have vocal cord dysfunction. So that's a separate additional diagnosis which is most commonly found in young females with asthma. Uh, occasionally, but quite rarely, it's found in patients with no asthma at all. Um, but the vast majority of patients have underlying asthma. 
And for those patients, um, stress, emotions, strong smells can trigger their vocal cord dysfunction. And classically, that's a, a kind of a tightening around the neck. They'll often do that um, with their hand where they'll say that, that I, I feel my asthma worsening here in their neck. And that's generally that their vocal cords are, are tightening and um, that they can't breathe. So, so that would be more a trigger rather than of asthma per se, uh, per se in, in and of itself. Um, but interestingly, if you have vocal cord dysfunction and asthma, if you treat your asthma really well, it reduces your tendency of the vocal cord dysfunction to trigger, So, um, which makes sense because your airways are less inflamed, so you're, you're less sensitive to your, your vocal cord triggers. Another question here, um, and I don't know if uh, this individual is um, a physician or, or a pharmacist, and probably the response might be different depending on the skill set. So this patient, uh, person has asked, in the first age treatment of a patient um, who is not responding to their own inhaler, what can I do to help? So I would think that most uh, physicians find an acute severe asthma attack a very frightening scenario, including my own intensive care unit uh, colleagues. So I was in a meeting recently with our, our ICU, um, some of our ICU team and the ICU registrar was saying she got a scenario for acute asthma in, in an exam and she was petrified. So a severe asthma attack is really frightening. And unfortunately, sometimes the best thing to do is just trying to get that patient to hospital because unfortunately, it can be too late in terms of response to um, a short acting beta agonist. However, as you're getting that patient to hospital, you can pretty much give them as much of that blue inhaler as you can get into them. And I wouldn't worry about the concept of, oh, too much will be harmful. If they're at risk for dying from their asthma, in that setting of trying to get them to hospital, um, you can give them and keep giving them their blue inhaler. Um, ideally, if you have a spacer device to administer the inhaler into the spacer is the best way for them to get that down into their lungs because the technique with those um, meter dose inhalers is really tricky. And if they're struggling to breathe, it's even, even worse again. So I hope that answers your question. I'm happy if you want to send a follow up um, on that. Um, the next question, I have heard that mild asthma may improve over the years. Is this true or is this generally not the case? So that's a great question. What we see mostly is that if people have childhood asthma, they absolutely can grow out of their asthma and their asthma can go away. What seems to be the case is if asthma occurs as an adult or if a childhood asthma comes back, that tends to stay. So about a quarter of Asthma is in patients over 25 when it's first first onset, so no history of childhood asthma. And what I counsel patients is if they have asthma as an adult, it is likely to stay. It can still be mild. It doesn't have to be severe um, and they may or may not need treatment, but it won't go away um, at that stage. So your your best chance of, of it uh, growing out of it as such is if it, if it settles during childhood or adolescence. Um, that um, it may go away altogether. Unfortunately, it can come back at any time, so you don't actually know if it'll come back or not, um, uh, but it's not something that, of course, that you can control as such. The only thing I would say is that if you were known to be allergic uh, to, to go to continue with allergen avoidance. Uh, next question here, how do you treat patients with food allergies which can trigger an acute asthma attack? Um, excellent question. Food allergy in asthma or as a cause of asthma is actually quite unusual. So food allergy is a, a, a different diagnosis altogether to asthma. So we do have some asthmatic patients who have both food allergy and allergic asthma. Um, but the vast majority of allergic asthmatics do not have uh, food allergy. Um, it can, so food allergy, part of the allergy response is bronchospasm. And so it can uh, trigger uh, acute bronchospasm. Um, and essentially the treatment is, uh, is around the um, food avoidance is, is one. So firstly, identifying 
that you truly are allergic to that um, food, which really is probably best done through an immunologist. So in Ireland, we um, our allergists are generally immunologists. In the UK, there tends to be separate dedicated allergists and separate immunologists. Um, so really important to identify that it is a genuine food allergy because some people have um, non-allergic, I suppose, um, symptoms related to food that's not true allergy. And and then I suppose there's um, some concepts around uh, desensitization with regards to food, which again would be under specialist advice. Uh, but a lot of it is actually figuring out which foods you're allergic to and unfortunately mostly avoidance of that. Um, if you have asthma and food allergy, then it's very important that your asthma is well controlled so that if you were to have um, an allergic reaction to foods that you don't have very inflamed asthma on top because that could be a really um, potent combination. So we would frequently have patients referred to us from our immunologists who they're concerned their asthma isn't controlled and that we would work to control their asthma. Next question, in terms of children with asthma who may grow out of it, can we assume that this is as a result of their reactions to allergens changing over time? Uh, no, we can't assume that. Um, definitely your um, degree of reactivity on blood and skin prick testing can change over time. Um, but the more you're exposed to it, the more uh, reactive you can be. Um, so it might be that their exposures changed over time rather than their inherent uh, ability to uh, to react to it. Uh, so that uh, has a, a largely genetic uh, de underlying determination. Uh, so we don't fully understand why some patients grow out of their asthma and others don't. Uh, but definitely allergen avoidance would be uh, important in that, but it's definitely not the, the full story. Great. Uh, the next question here, how does exhaled nitric oxide indicate how a patient will respond to mon monoclonal antibodies? So essentially, the all of the, the available monoclonal antibodies, both the older one, which is anti-IgE, and the newer ones, which currently are anti-IL-5, and there's further... Um, um, antibodies that are coming downstream, um, all of them treat Th2 high asthma. And so elevated pheno is consistent with Th2 high asthma. What's interesting when they've looked at different studies where they've measured pheno um, in these patients, interestingly, for some of the monoclonal antibodies, even having a high pheno didn't necessarily predict if the patient was going to respond or not. So it's interesting, just some studies have shown that it does predict it and others haven't for, for the different monoclonal antibodies. Um, but overall, what we would say when we look globally at patients, say with high blood eosinophils, which is, is a marker of Th2 high, overall, the higher eosinophil level, the more likely you're to respond. And I would say the higher your pheno or the fact that you have pheno high asthma would make you more likely to respond to monoclonal antibodies. Um, it, it just hasn't been as consistent as some of the blood eosinophil data, um, but that, um, uh, you know, partly maybe study design rather than major differences between the, um, the cytokines themselves. That's Pretty much it, I guess, for now. There was a question there from one of our colleagues, I guess, working in a pharmacy in the Middle East uh, about getting Arabic subtitles on some videos. Yet we'll follow up with that. And by all means, we can add a QR code um, to that. Yeah, I'll follow up after this. Um, but other than that, um, I'd just like to thank Dr. Ryan for her time this morning um, and a really interesting lecture. Um, and if there's any questions, feel free to contact us here at any stage. The webinar is available on demand. If you sign up, you can. it should be available in the next hour to two hours. Um, so you can look at it on demand going forward. Um, but from me, thanks very much to Dr. Ryan for her time this morning. And thank you very much for having me and great questions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.